in terms of outer suburbs, in terms of uh, delivering literacy uh, programs. And the next area is up here where the baby boomers officially come out of the workforce into early active retirement. And again, you saw the, the, the literacy issues skyrocket in the, in the 60s. Um, one of the um, analyses I've done on volunteering is that not just which towns uh, have the greatest propensity to volunteer, but at what time in life are you most likely to volunteer? And the highest contributions to volunteering is actually made by people aged 65 to 74. So you've got this bucket of people in Queensland, it's going to tick into the 60 to 74 demographic. You've got a lot of goodwill. How can you harness that goodwill? What program can you set up to harness people who want to make a contribution to literacy um, in the next decade? To me, this is the greatest opportunity. Goodwill, lots of people moving into that time in life, um, and also, not just in terms of, you know, say, linking up with primary schools, but also are there literacy programs peer-to-peer? -peer? You know, a 65-year-old um, tertiary educator person in retirement looking for an opportunity to help other people in their same demographic. So again, this is an opportunity. It's about organisation. Recognise the opportunity. What programs can we set up in order to harness this uh, as, as we move into the... Uh, into the next decade. Um, in the next chart, I want to talk about the way in which the different age groups, the different generations, cope with um, education um, or the education skills that they had. In order to do this, I've gone back 80 years to look at life expectancy in Australia in 1931. In 1931, the average Australian lived for 63 years. You qualified for the age pension at 65, so you promptly dropped dead two years before you got a pension. <laughs> back in 1931. The other thing to note is that in 1931, you're a child for 14 years, and then you're an adult. The life form we now know as the teenager it did not exist in 1931. Childhood, adulthood, old age, and death. That's the way it worked 80 years ago, and you're an old person at 51 or 52. When you get home tonight, get out your family photograph albums, have a look at pictures of your grandparents at the age of 50. They were old people. They looked old, they dressed old, they knew they had about 10 years to go. And in fact, <laughs> the other point is, up to, um, up to this point, you were a child for 14 years, and I know in Victoria, uh, at 14 years, you would have had year eight, and you got what was known as your merit. And that was enough. I mean, if you're going to work on a farm or in a factory or house cleaning or keeping or whatever it is, you did not need any greater education than eight years formal education and then you went straight into adulthood. Um, and of course, no need to save for retirement. There was no need for superannuation because you knew you were going to drop dead in the workplace. So, uh, fortunately, that is 80 years ago. 80, 40 years later, 1971, life expectancy is now kicked out to 71 years. That is six years in retirement. That has to be planned for provision for either by the individual or by the state. The other thing that's happened by 1971 is that the baby boomers have come along, they've invented a transition phase between childhood and adulthood called the teenage phase in life, 13 to 19, and it sort of makes sense. You now go through to year 11 or perhaps even 12 uh, because you have a more sophisticated economy. Uh, you have office jobs, knowledge jobs suddenly start to emerge and you need greater literacy, numeracy, skills, document skills if you like. Um, and you're now not an old person until well into your 60s. Let's kick that forward another 40 years to 2011. Oh. Life expectancy for the average Aussie has now kicked out to 82 years. 83 for women and 79 for... That is 17 years in retirement that has to be planned for provision for, either by the individual or by the state. The other thing that has happened by, 19, uh, by 2011 is that the, um, the uh, in fact, the, the average age of retirement for an Australian is now no longer 65, it's actually 58. That is 24 years in retirement that you can look forward to. Although statistically, if you make it through to 58, you've got more than 24 years, you've got about 27 years in retirement. Let's just say the last couple of years ain't so hot. So you've got about 20 healthy, active years of life. 
what are you going to do? Sit at home and babysit the grandkids? Or are you going to re-engineer that space? And the opportunity, I think, for ser service organisations, literacy programs, would be to write yourself into the narrative of life for baby boomers aged 58 to 78. You're a retired school teacher, you're sitting home, got nothing to do, here is a literacy program to harness your goodwill and volunteering spirit in your early 60s and 70s, early 60s or late 60s. It's an opportunity to actually re-engineer that time in life. You can be either part of that or you can just let it wash over you. What I am saying is this is a fantastic opportunity. Build social cohesion, gives meaning, I think, to life uh, beyond the age of 58, harnesses skills that may not be want to be used, you know, 40 hours or 50 hours a week, and I think builds community spirit and delivers a good outcome. I cannot see anything but a win-win for this, and the next decade is the time to do that. The other shift, of course, over the last decade has been Generation Y and X, who've um, reached in and re-engineered a particular decade. Over the last decade, Gen X and Gen Y have picked up the teenage phase in life. They've picked it up and they've stretched it. <laughs> I think you're now a teenager between the ages of 13 and 29. All of the measures of the transition into adulthood that baby boomers make in 21, 22, 23 commitment to marriage, mortgage, children and a career has been kicked out by Generation X and now by Generation Y to 28, 29 or 30. This changes the use of discretionary time and spending in the 20-something time in life. If you're not committed to marriage, mortgage, children and a career, you don't need to be in a three-bedroom brick veneer on the edge of town. You need to be in an inner-city apartment where you can form, dismantle and reform relationships before you make your final selection, just on the right side of 30. Have a look at what is popular on television. Out with neighbours, in with friends, Seinfeld, Sex and the City. No one's married, no one has kids. These are tribal relationships. Form, dismantle, reform relationships. And in fact, if you look at the driving force behind this, it is a postponement of commitment to marriage. In 1971, the average age of first marriage for an Australian woman was 21. She was a baby boomer born in 1950 she would have announced her engagement on her 21st birthday, otherwise she thought she was going to be on the shelf. Whereas today, the average age of first marriage for an Australian woman is 29. Eight years has opened up, cafes, bars, restaurants, gap years. And in fact, if you were to today announce your engagement on your 21st birthday, you would be regarded as a loser. You should have completed tertiary education, paid off hex, travelled overseas, established and developed a career, trialled, even road-tested relationships, then commit to marriage and mortgage at 28 or 29. That shift has created um, an extension, well, in fact it has delivered a, a change in the narrative of how people live their lives in their 20s. You don't get married at 21, you're going to marry at 28, 29 or 30. Cafes, bars, restaurants, tertiary education. Women now outnumber men in terms of university graduates. This is an extraordinary contribution to the, uh, to the knowledge economy. The other shift that has occurred over the last decade has been baby boomers who've picked up the teenage phase in life as a transition phase. They've picked it up and they've reinserted it into the 50-something <laughs> time in life as a new teenage phase, as a transition phase. Baby boomers invented a transition into adulthood 40 years ago and now they're inventing a transition into retirement. Sea change, tree change, suddenly emerge out of nowhere over the last decade. A new concept coming out of California is the portfolio lifestyle stage in the life cycle. Work two days a week, play golf one day of the week, do some volunteering, some mentoring on another day of the week, do something with your spouse, invest in your relationship. It's a bit of this, it's a bit of that, it's simply a better business model than the 20th century notion of working to the age of 65, getting a gold watch and retiring. The question and the challenge is, how can you and your organisation write yourself into that narrative? 58 year old, yep, come along to our organisation. We want you, be part of our camaraderie if you like. Feel useful, make a contribution to the community. Be involved with young people, be involved with other, it's a matter of setting up those and putting the right marketing and pitch around it. That's the challenge, that's the opportunity. It is not an opportunity for the 2020s. It is an opportunity 
for now, right here, right now, and particularly in those hotspots and in those demographics that uh, I was talking about uh, previously. In the next chart, I want to talk very briefly uh, about, um, how are we going for time? Five minutes, okay. Um, I want to talk very briefly about, I might just move through the next one and, uh, and go through to uh, this chart, where I've identified some um, education skills from the last census. There is a new census uh, in August of this year, but we don't get the results until August of next year. And this provides you with an indication of, um, of um, teaching skills in Australia in 2006. And there's probably a dozen different uh, jobs, primary school teacher, secondary school teacher, so what is that? It's probably a quarter of a million teachers on the Australian continent five years ago. Uh, preschool aid, English as a second language teacher, uh, vocational education teacher. And this is the number over the previous five-year period. So there's been a 53% increase in integration aids over that time. 22% increase in special needs teachers, 17% increase in university lecturers. Now we've moved into tertiary education, Chinese and Indians, of course. Um, and not a lot of growth down in, say, English as a second language teacher, which I would have thought is uh, quite, quite strange. The total workforce increased by 10%. So all of these skills, jobs, have expanded at a faster than average rate in the first half of the first decade of the 21st century as a fact uh, in, in, in Australia. You can actually go into some of these demographics and I think we'll, um, we'll take these two, primary school and secondary school teacher. Let's go into that demographic and look at their age profile. And here is the age profile. It's actually just secondary school teachers. So in 2001, there was 105,000 of them. And here's their age profile. Most secondary school teachers in Australia 10 years ago were aged 45 to 49. Here's their age profile five years later. 50 to 54. 34% of secondary school teachers on the Australian continent are aged over 50. Or, more correctly, five years ago were aged over 50. And my point is this. At any point over the next five years, one third of the teaching workforce can walk into the principal and say, I'm out of here. Thank you very much. I'm all done. That's OK. We've got lots of teachers coming. Well, we haven't, actually. <laughs> Who's going to teach? Where are you going to get them? It's not an issue at the moment because all those baby boomers are just on the right side of 55, 58. In the next five years in Queensland, right across Australia, you're going to get this massive outflow of baby boomers. It's like that bubble, if you like, crosses a line. So skills in literate skilling up, programs designed to actually deliver more, or, um, in fact, um, migration programs to bring teachers in would be another solution to this, uh, to this problem, I suppose. Um, and just finally, some observations about uh, what all this means, I suppose. You do actually get a, uh, a copy of the slides. Um, I suppose my main points are that literacy rises and falls throughout the life cycle. You know, that young versus old. Uh, the other point about, um, um, you know, there is a very big difference between what is happening in Norway, what is happening in Italy. Um, I would actually suggest very not suggest a fact-finding tour to, uh, to Norway. Uh, but if you do go, go in summer, I would suggest. Uh, but you could actually find out exactly what is the budgetary allocation on a per capita basis. And I think if you're putting in a submission, that would certainly, that would certainly help. Um, anyway, look, there's a number of observations there that we, we went through right throughout the, uh, the presentation. You can go through at your leisure when you, uh, when you go through the presentation. Just finally, in the last couple of minutes, I want to introduce you to a new piece of research that I've been doing over the last couple of years. It's on a subject known as the Great Australian Man Drought. Uh, and in this chart that I'm about to show you, shows you the relationship between the number of men and the number of women in every year of life from, from where are we? Back there. From birth through to the age of 75. And all I've done is to simply subtract the number of boys from the number of girls in every age group. And um, when you plot the results on a chart, it looks like this. Everything above the line means there's more boys in that age group than girls. And you can see at birth, there are in fact about 5,000 more boy babies than girl babies born in Australia. Every year, right throughout Australia, right throughout the world, right throughout history, 
there are always slightly more boys born than girls. And the reason is that boys have a higher mortality rate in youth. They're greater risk takers. I don't know, hunting mammoths over a million years. <laughs> Mother Nature has worked out if she wants an equal number of boys and girls for reproduction, she has to oversupply boys at birth. So this oversupply continues through childhood, teenage years. I'll put some labels around this. Through childhood, teenage years, up to the age of 18, 19 or 20, and there is still an oversupply of boys relative to girls. There's no man drought, there is a Sheila shortage. And in fact, women, women never have it as good as at 18, 19 or 20. They should be knocking them back with a stick. Then of course, it all heads south. After the age of 27, there is as a fact, more women than men on the Australian continent and it reaches a low point at the age of 35. So if you are single, female and 35, it's not you, there just ain't the product out there. <laughs> and then of course, it all kicks back to this rocky outcrop of men at 58. So if you miss out in a fella by 27, you can always pick up an old guy at uh, 58. <laughs> then, of course, then of course, men die off at a more rapid rate after 65, so you have widow world. You can use this chart to strategically manage your love life. <laughs> Women should use their numbers advantage in their 20s to their advantage. Trial this, trial that, road test this partner, road test that partner, but make sure you lock down your quarry into marriage by 27 <laughs> so that you can survive the long, cold winter of the man drought. <laughs> For men, the strategy is completely different. No matter how good the offer is in your 20s, Hold out for a better numbers later on. <laughs> and if you can hold out for 75, three girls for every boy. As bad as the man drought is in Australia, it is in fact even worse than this in New Zealand. I'm going to show you the same chart for New Zealand. Oh. If you are a 35 year old heterosexual woman living in New Zealand, you have as much chance of finding a male partner your age as does a 75-year-old woman. And in fact, the reason is that 75-year-old men in New Zealand are dead and 35-year-old men are not in New Zealand. They're up, they're off, they're out of there. And that is my point. Australia and New Zealand are emerging as these small satellites on the edge of the global solar system where stronger economies are exerting this gravitational force, drawing out our youngest, our brightest, our most ambitious, our slightly more male occupations. It provided with a job opportunity overseas. It exacerbates the skill shortage and now upsets the gender balance. I'm very happy for our kids to go overseas, but I want them back. I want them back at 28, 29 or 30, committed to a relationship, committed to a career, take out a mortgage, have kids and to pay tax for 40 years. It's, that is, this is not about sentimentality, it's about brutal economic rationalism. If I spend 25 years of taxpayer funds invested into a kid to come out of University of Queensland, then I want them to spend their youth, their energy, their dynamism in my country, not someone else's. I'm very aware that we attract the best and brightest of other countries, but I'm greedy. I want the best and brightest of other countries, and I want to attract and retain the best and brightest of Australians. And I also think that it's a reflection of something we thought we had got rid of decades ago, a cultural colonial cringe. Oh, my son's doing really well, he's in London. Oh, my daughter's doing really well, she's in New York. Australian baby boomers get off on how far out of the country they've been able to catapult their kids. <laughs> this is a measure of success in a colonial middle class society. It's a reflection on you as a parent about where in the world you've been able to catapult your kids. If you are anyone in Auckland, then your kids are not in Auckland. If you are anyone in Brisbane, are your kids in Brisbane? We need to shift the paradigm. We need to send the right messages to Gen Y. I actually write for a magazine called The Wish Magazine. Uh, two years ago, they ran a feature called um, Generation Expat. And they had allocated you know, photographs of all these people all over the world doing jobs. They had a half-page glossy photo devoted to a 28-year-old male from Melbourne working in Florence as a barista. What that says is that to Generation Y, it is sexier to be a barista in Florence than it is to be a bricky in Caboolture or Cranbourne. My view is that we need to be sending the right messages. We are equally as, as 
proud of you if you actually come back and invest in our country. There's a demographer out of Adelaide, Graham Hugo, who's done some work on Generation Expat, and his conclusion was that if someone is away for four years or more, they go native. They form a personal relationship or they get sufficiently advanced in an organisation that they cannot then get back to Australia. I see this as a big issue. This was never an issue in the 20th century. It is very much an issue in the 21st century. We are in a global market for talent, skills and labour. And the more educated our skills and labour are in Australia, and particularly given our colonial cringe culture of seeing over there as being more exciting than back there, back here, um, I think that this is actually quite dangerous. There are five million New Zealanders on this planet. Only four million live in New Zealand. 20% of that race now float about the globe, and they are ain't your average New Zealand, educated, skilled, entrepreneurial, lateral thinking. Half a million are actually in Australia. If the same proportion applied to Australia, it would be four and a half to five million people. This was not an issue in the 20th century, but I think it's very much an issue for the 21st. Thank you very much. Well, Bernard, thank you. Can we just have the microphone, please? Bernard, thank you very much uh, for your fascinating talk. I have to say that um, you gave me great hope when you were speaking. You said, you know, we've got some, some really good things coming forward in terms of this potential raising of the societal expectation with some, and also this notion of volunteerism and how we could possibly harness that in the liter liter um, literacy area. The other thing that I liked uh, was that you said it's going to take us longer to get old. I'm very <laughs> pleased about that. I'm, I'll be 82 before I'm old now. Uh, and that we'll actually have 24 years in retirement, which will be very, very valuable. So I think um, Bernard has covered a lot of material for us today. Uh, he's given us a significant reframe for what we could do in our retirement um, to really contribute to this issue. And also has given us some, some more sobering thoughts about what uh, we need to do to maintain this great nation of Australia. So what I'd like to do now is open the floor to questions. We are also are accepting questions via Twitter. That hashtag again is hash SLQLLF. Um, but if I could perhaps ask if there are any questions from the floor. So we do have some roving mics around. We've got one down here. Best question gets a book. Twenty-nine ninety-five for the value. <laughs> Bernard, uh, your one of your early graphs of functional illiteracy showed a kick up uh, what sixty and above. And you seem to be suggesting that uh, disengagement from work uh, led to uh, a, diminish, uh, a diminution uh, in uh, literacy skills. Can that graph not also be read to show that uh, the sort of suggestion that papers like to make every three to five years, that there is a crisis in the school system and there was some golden age of education in the past when everything works so much better is simply not true? Look, I, I thought it was interesting. I, I mean, I actually thought that, uh, initially I thought that might be the case, that um, people my age and older uh, might have had uh, better skills because we were taught, you know, I was taught by nuns or whatever, um, uh, reading, writing and arithmetic. Um, but this would suggest either two things, that my assessment is correct, that when people come out of the workforce, then they lose those skills. They're not using them daily. Therefore, they're rusty when they're measured by the Australian Bureau of Statistics. Or, in fact, that the um, education system in the 1960s, 50s and 40s uh, was um, less um, proficient than it was in, say, the 70s, 80s and 90s, but not the 2000s. Now, I actually think it's the workforce engagement issue, but it's, um, it's open to interpretation. I'm putting it out there. I'm not saying that is it. But, you know, your view, you know, it's a fair observation and there would be better people in this room than myself to, uh, to actually provide that, uh, provide that assessment. But I felt it was too, if I, knowing workforce participation figures, uh, as I do, you do see workforce participation easing, you know, that as people come out, you know, they might be working only two days a week. Uh, and so the less engagement in the workplace you have, um, uh, literacy issues uh, rise. So whether it's a cause and effect, or just you know a convenient association. I don't know. It's something perhaps we, we can look at look into. Next one. Okay, we've got another question down the line. Thanks, Bernard. I'm still on that slide. 
it's easy to focus on where the, the graph kicks up and it, that's a bit terrifying. But even at our best case scenario there, we're looking at like a 31-year-old-ish uh, person and there's still 33% or so of the population oh, sure. functionally sure. illiterate. That's huge, isn't it? Well, the, the other thing that's shocking about this is because everyone here is level five, or at least four to five, I would have thought, and everyone here probably mixes, like I do, with other four to five people. I had no idea that one third at best, one third of Australians at best, are functionally illiterate by this measure. Now, whether in fact you know they can read labels and all that sort of, I, I don't know. But uh, I find that uh, an indictment. And I thought, oh my God, this country is going to rack and ruin until you see the other countries and you think, you know, um, you know it's not hard. Is it, is it unreasonable to expect that that really should be down there? Is it unreasonable to have, let's metricize this. As an objective, we will try to get this measure down to 20% um, by the year 2020. 20% by 2020. Um, and what contribution would that make to the knowledge economy? How could we do that? What are the tactics, this volunteering harnessing thing? I really like that. I mean, you know, if you're sitting around at home, 58-year-old retired primary school teacher, now you may not be wanting to deal with kids, you have kids all your life, but how can you actually build, uh, make that contribution? And what I especially like about that is um, the, heart, the, the, the social cohesion the cohesiveness that that delivers into communities. Hi, Bernard. Um, my name's Michelle. Um, I want to question whether the country is really going to rack and ruin. Um, I don't wh wh whether the country is? Well, whether it really is. I actually come from the arts sector. And, and one of my propositions is that um, instead of just the focus being on literacy, perhaps the combination of arts and literacy, I actually have a son in school and um, he actually, he's in last year of primary school and he finds learning really boring. Yep. And so one of the things that I have to propose is to bring creativity back into the schools and my understanding is that um, arts funding has actually been cut all around and taking out creativity um, from schools is, is actually a crazy option. Um, we're just focusing on yeah. literacy and that can be pretty boring. Uh, yes, I, I see where you're coming from. I'm actually a great supporter of arts and creativity. Um, and I would see great value in better funding, better focus on that. The, the focus today has been on literacy. Um, I don't see it as an either or. We're focusing on either literacy in all its form or on arts and creativity. In an ideal world, you would have both measured and, and brought to the uh, fore. Yeah, that seems... Oh, sorry. Just can I, can I have that back? That just seems to be isolating the two. Um, just from what you're saying is that they're actually currently isolated and they're not actually um, separate um, things to consider. So, so, so you're, you're saying they should be, what, brought together? Integrated, in yeah. Well, again, that would, that's, that's for, th for this audience to determine how best to actually deliver literacy and creativity. Um, uh, look, I, I, haven't actually, I haven't actually measured um, arts funding or creativity, um, but um, I would like to see that, I would certainly like to see that, uh, that leveraged up as well. I think that you actually require both for uh, successful uh, personal development. You can't be just uh, focused on literacy issues, numeracy issues, and not have um, a creative element as well. So in an ideal world, you'd have both of those delivered as an objective throughout the next uh, 10 years. Just to continue with that, there's print literacy and there's digital literacy. Yes. And if the kids were to set the literacy tests, they'd do extremely well. Yep. And most of us would do rather poorly mm. at the other end of the scale. And I would say all of these statistics are literacy-based and therefore not very good predictors yep. of where things are going. Uh, I think that's a fair comment. When I was doing this, I thought, this is a very 2006 concept. So um, digital literacy. Now, um, I, I never learned how to program a VCR. Um, so uh, <laughs> uh, in terms of uh, literacy, yes, probably a five. 
definitely a five. But in terms of digital literacy, no, my 20-year-old kids, uh, w without a doubt, maybe the next version of this, now this is a survey that's done every five years or so, um, maybe the next version of this would have other measures of literacy, creativity uh, and, uh, and digital uh, awareness, digital proficiency, if you like. And if digital proficiency uh, literacy, then you might actually find <laughs> the chart going something like that. In which case, the opportunity for digital literacy is still here, if you like. Just towards the so the, the very concept of, of literacy is changing. That's what we're getting from both of these questions. Um, Australia is one of the few countries in the Western world that doesn't recognise dyslexia as a funded learning disability. Uh, even New Zealand recognised it in 2007 and started up pro a dyslexia foundation and programs in their schools. Um, do you think, for me, that's part of the reason why our literacy levels are so shocking. Do you have a comment on that? Well, I, um, I'm not across that level of detail, but I find that unusual. I find that extraordinary that that, that is not uh, acknowledged um, quite distinctively uh, within Australia. Hopefully that that would be um, uh, remedied. Uh, but, uh, but again, I, I'm simply not across the, uh, the detail of that. Um, in terms of the comparison with the other countries, I don't think New Zealand was on the list. Um, you're, you're saying that that could, that could actually impact these, um, these figures? Well, other countries like uh, England and America have put money into dyslexia right. and they yep. have specialised learning centres and schools. Yes. And New Zealand's been doing that since 2007. And here, um, the government hasn't committed to addressing that. And when you look at apparently 30 to 60% of our prisoners are dyslexic as well. Yes. So it impacts on a huge of range of things. Well, in which case, that's, that's clearly a, um, a, an omission, an error. Hopefully that will be remedied uh, very quickly. So I would certainly agree with the proposition you're putting forward. Uh, I had a question down here. And then we'll come to you, Bill. Bernard, the question, it's a comment and a question that kind of picks up on the comment earlier about the art sector and the approach to literacy, I suppose. And I'm, I'm looking at the results we're getting, seeing in America from um, the kind of commentary from people like uh, Professor Zipes, saying that if we go back to more traditional literacy teaching, which America has actually done, they're not getting the results from that. So there's a concern with that when we're talking about the kind of impact of perhaps migration from Chinese and Indian uh, families who have a very structured way of viewing literacy teaching. So that's a concern. I think the other thing is picking up on the arts sector is looking at by way of the question. Have you seen any evidence of the sorts of in impact of community publishing, for example, as a program that picks up on the, in the um, intersection between culture, art and literacy? Um, well, I suppose I would... Um, I don't suppose I've seen any quite specific research or, or evidence. Um, I'm not sure whether you're familiar with a, um, uh, with, a uh, sorry, with a demographer or a social analyst in the US called Richard Florida, called The Rise. He's written a seminal book called The Rise of the Creative Class. And his argument is that society is enhanced, enriched, developed, if you like, by the fusion of creativity. Now, creativity come, can come from traditional arts activities, but creativity also in a digital sense. He talks about the creativity of Sil Silicon Valley, the creativity to think about, you know, whatever it is Google people think about, if you like. So I think that there is creativity in modern society. Uh, the, his theory is that you create density, you create this artsy culture, if you like, typically in the inner city, and you can see that very much in Brisbane. Um, and particularly over the last 10 years, all of the, um, the computer game industry that's now gravitating around the West End, if you like, and if you look at the transition, the extraordinary transition of West End through to Woolloongabba through to Fortitude Valley uh, on, from Melbourne. I was stayed in Brisbane about seven or eight years ago on a Friday night for some function. And I was in a restaurant in New Farm. It was unbelievable. It was like I could have been in Chapel Street, South Yarra, or in Paddington in, in Sydney. It was exactly the same culture, the same people. You know, they'd be dressed in black, they'd have the shaved head, that sort of edgy eyewear. They greeted each other the same way. So that sort of artsy intellectual, inner-city, urban, creative culture, if you like. That's, that's building on Richard Florida's argument. And the, his argument is to actually take and create that culture and you actually infuse it into places like Townsville and Cairns, 
might be a bit of a challenge in those places, but, but, but that, that's the argument, that you actually create that, build that, uh, that creative community. I, th I think that's... I was just going to say one more thing. I think that's... Can we have um, just more, that microphone on again, please? Sorry, just one more thing I want to say. I'm from Melbourne, too. Yep. Um, it's interesting that it's also the City of Literature, but also has the gaming hub, as in creation of digital games for the whole of the Southern Hemisphere. That's true, yep. Is that a question? Hello, yes, my name's Christina. I picked up on two points in your fantastic statistics. Firstly, do you think that uh, the problem that's going to occur with our young people returning home to work as professionals in their 20s... From overseas. From overseas, might be related to the interesting nature of our workforce and the demographics of our workforce and the existence of permanent positions for those young people. I wondered if any demographers had uh, commented on that yeah. and done that work. And my second question was, in relation to literacy, what role do you see for libraries and librarians in that taking the literacy one step further, as I see it, and the teaching, the active teaching of research skills, of comprehension and of use of literate information. What role do you see continuing in the next uh, couple of decades for us? Oh, oh, just the second part first. I actually see a role, the way I would envisage this, and, and again, I, I recognise that there are people in the room who are better qualified to comment. I suppose I would have seen libraries and librarians as the harnessing point for volunteering programs. Um, so I, I think there's almost like a marshalling role, administ coordinate, it's like an orchestra conductor. So you actually got people coming and going and the library or community resource centres, whatever you call it these days, actually becomes the focal point uh, for a broader uh, community enhancement, uh, if you like. The point about Gen Ys coming back from overseas, I have actually done some work on that. Uh, and there was a massive inflow into Australia in 2008, 9 and 10, um, people coming back, mostly men, from London, Shanghai, Mumbai, Dubai, uh, not so much because of the opportunities here, but because of the impact of the global financial crisis. I actually made the reference, the, the research in reference to um, some easing in the man drought. Uh, all these boys were coming home. So I suggested uh, you could head them off between the customs and car park <laughs> at the, uh, the airport. Thank you. It's just a suggestion. It's a joke. You don't have to. Any other comments? Oh, there's some up here. Yep. Yeah, and then we'll go to the back. So here, down here. Yeah. And then people up here. Hello. Hello, Bernard. Um, in terms of the economy now requiring quite a, a high rate of workplace um, workforce participation, we do still have quite um, a high percentage of second and third generation unemployed. What evidence-based statistics would we use to um, argue for, you know, sort of these programs, not just skills-based, because it is about entering the workforce, it is about workforce ethics as well as yep. um, a whole lot of skills level. What, what evidence should we be using for this? Well, there, there is around about 470,000 people unemployed uh, at the moment in Australia. It's around about 4.5, 4.6%. Um, it's the lowest, it's, it's not quite at the lowest point uh, ever. Um, there is a quite, there's an out there view that in modern society, don't say that I subscribe to this, but there is a view out there that, certainly in the corporate world, that uh, an unemployment rate of 4 to 5% is effectively full employment in a modern society. And also that the total cost of that is an insurance premium that rich countries pay to guard against revolution. So you actually say that there is a 4 to 5% population that rightly or wrongly, fairly or unfairly, will not participate in the workforce. I'm not saying that's right. And I certainly think that there should be every effort and program made, especially in the current environment. And I know that's very much a, a government objective at the moment, as well as the disability. There's about 750,000 on disability. And then there's another group that is just not participating in the workforce. Our workforce participation is around about 66%. Of the population aged over 15, 66% or two-thirds are currently engaged either in the workforce or as unemployed people wanting to be in the workforce. That proportion in the US and the UK is about 65 to 67, so either side of our 66. In New Zealand, it's about 68. 
and then you jump to places like China at about 73. If we added a million people through unemployment or um, uh, disability, whatever, into, we would take our participation rate to a level that is well clear of our competitor nations, if you like. Now, you have to then say, well, is that possible? So it'd be a, a, it's a laudable and wonderful objective, but I don't think it's going to be possible. And it's not pleasant, it's not popular comment, but statistically, if New Zealand, UK, US can get it to maybe one or two percentage points, do you think it's really possible to push it out five percentage points up to the... And if you look at go to China, yes, the reason why this works because they're all in working you know, in rice paddies right through to the age of 85 or something like that. So you really, it's, it's, it's a big objective to get that level of workforce participation. We have to fight tooth and nail to get that 450,000 unemployed down even 10,000. The last 450,000 are really hard people to get engaged into the workforce. I'm sorry to tell you, but that is, that is the fact. Um, and, and which means we should not, should not not do it, but just don't expect easy results. Question. Hi, um, my name is Liz Plata. I work in the area of infant mental health, and um, a lot of the my basis is about social economist uh, James Heckman's work. So, my question is really about what do you think about the view that the way to support literacy is actually to support the social emotional well being of families with young children? Because the statistics are quite clear that if you invest in the, those early years, which are not in any of those stats, I yep. mean. We in this area, we actually have an infant toddler group before your primary, you know, your children. So your children are actually yep. split up into those groups because they're just as different as adolescents yeah. are really in terms so, of their So needs. your argument is investment in social cohesion, social yes. welfare, social yes. well-being, yes. social wellness, if you like, here actually improves the outcome. Yes. There. For I, I, again, I would agree. I would yep. agree entirely. Um, um, you know, it's a, it's a whole of society uh, approach is what I would say. And just investing in specific programs, yep, that's required, you know, to, to men and to young people and old people and rural people and indigenous communities. They're like sort of rifle shots. But, the, and the, but there's a broader based thing that we can do where we can actually talk about volunteering. Yes, well, Where we can talk thinking. about really uh, social well-being yep. of families, relationships, households, kids, if you like. And literacy is part of that yep. process, really. When, I agree. when those volunteers work with those yep. families, literacy is part of the outcome that actually comes out of that yep. thing, as well as feeling better about themselves, which helps them to learn. E exactly. Look, there's, there's, out of this, there's, there's any number of strategic directions. Uh, some of them are rifle shots, but I think others are bro more broadly based. And the point that you have just raised is, is, is a broadly based uh, uh, approach. In, in an ideal world, if I was running a strategy session for a corporate, I said, we need someone to document all, all of these, to capture them, uh, and then to actually have people flesh them out. Uh, and then who's going to do what, by when, and how we're going to measure it, and let's reconvene in 12 months and see what we've actually achieved. That's how you would actually develop a strategy. So let's go through the day today and come with all this great strategic thinking, but what do we do just then say, oh, that was really interesting, and go back to our jobs. Or do we actually capture it, nail figures, people, outcomes to it, and see what we can actually achieve? We've got time now for one more question. So uh, I've got a question down here. Now, I do need to also say that Bernard will be staying with us until the right. lunch period today. Much, so yes. he will, you'll have an opportunity to ask him some questions then as well, I'm Perfect. sure. So, Thank you very much. Um, Sue McCarricker from the National Year of Reading 2012. I just wanted to ask, Bernard, having seen all those figures, for the National Year of Reading next year, we've got some programs, we're doing, going to do a workplace literacy initiative, we're going to do the Reading Hour, which is a bit like Earth Hour, we've got lots of great things that libraries are doing. From your perspective, what is the one thing we could do in the National Year of Reading 2012? What's the audience we could hit? What should we do? Uh, well, the audience I would like to see hit is the uh, 60s and 70s. Um, now, how you actually hit them, I'm not quite sure, because you can't get them through the workplace. Uh, maybe get them through church groups. Uh, oddly enough, um, you find these people are quite devout. Um, if you look at other demographics, see that uh, propensity to believe in God actually increases 
Uh, so, in fact, the closer you get to God, the closer you get to God. <laughs> but, but perhaps through, perhaps through I would, I'm deadly serious. I would work through uh, church groups, um, sporting, well, not so much sporting groups, but uh, service organisations and so forth. Um, but um, certainly, certainly church groups would be the one that I would, um, uh, you know, I don't know, Bible reading or whatever it is, uh, but, but that's how I would do it. Thank you. Bernie, and thanks very much. And we've got your book we need to book. actually give to somebody. Yes, I'm so going, going to give it to that. the very first brave question mm -hmm. asker. So <laughs> this person here. Thank you very much. And, and Bernard, thank you very much. A very... Uh, very uh, Great Thank contribution you. today to the, to the discussion. So we're now going to move on to our next speaker. Actually, we're actually going to have a five minute stretch of the legs actually before we move on to our next speaker, who's Deb Storm. So we're just going to get back together if we can in, in five minutes time, which will be at, um, at, at five past 11, 10 past 11. Um, no, I'm not going to use it, but I just want to turn this. Oh, let me turn that around. And I'm going to give that to And what's. Is that the mouse? Or? There's the mouse on the back. Okay, so what's that? So I just. So you're, you're, yeah, so yeah. this mouse over oh, there. Yeah. So you get the hand up and just uh, left click that. And it'll open up your presentation. Yeah. And the lights have to shine in your and you don't you don't have to get right up no, close no, to the microphone. No. It's uh, just that lights in my eye, so it's a bit hard. I'll, I'll, I can back can those you, down a little yeah, bit. Yeah. Can you like not have the light because that light is well, right so in my eyes. Yeah. I, no, I, can, no. I can turn them down a little bit, but because we're webcasting it, you're on camera. Yeah. Okay. So we still need to be able to see you. No, that's all right. It's just that my eyes, because I'll have to read. Yeah. And we'll turn them down a little bit. Yeah, just a tiny yeah. bit. That's fine. So I'll just leave that there. Yep.